Hi. Uh, so tonight I'd like to talk about another divorce in the Dublin Divorces series. And this is a divorce involving a solicitor. And it is the McNiff divorce case from 1888. And it has some interesting connections, not just with the legal profession, but with medicine and literature also. So I'm going to start by the marriage, as every good divorce starts with the marriage. The marriage in this case was uh, between John Charles McNiff and Julie Oliver. And you can see there from the wedding announcement in the Derry Journal that it took place at Dominic Street Church, not far from King's Inns, and that the groom was the son of a solicitor from Sligo, and the bride was the daughter of John Oliver, and he was a mill owner from Galway. And she was one of the four Oliver sisters, and we'll be talking about them a little more later. But you can see that John Charles McNiff's residence is described as in Enniskillen, and it's Willoughby Place. And I'm not sure what house it was in Willoughby Place, Enniskillen, but this is an example of one of the houses there, a very nice Georgian terrace of houses. And uh, shortly after the wedding, uh, Mrs. McNiff was presented at court because uh, her family had some connections, as we'll see, with Dublin society. And uh, she had a very, very impressive outfit on. It was reported in the newspaper and it was described as a presentation train of the richest cream colored Duchess Sachin satin, sorry, <laughs> uh, trimmed with bouillons of, uh, of tulle, uh, bouquets of myrtle and stephanotis, uh, corsage à la grec, and uh, there were, her ornaments were described as uh, rubies and diamonds, so a very elaborate outfit to be presented at court. So she hadn't actually been presented at court or Dublin Castle, as it was known in Ireland. She hadn't actually been presented there as a debutante, but she was presented on marriage. And uh, you can see there just an example of a lady being presented to the Lord Lieutenant at the Dublin Castle receptions. And again, this particular lady is wearing a very elaborate costume. So it was a very dressed up affair. You can see also just a, a zoom out picture of one of the receptions in Dublin Castle for presentations to the Lord Lieutenant. Uh, so very, very elaborate and the cream of Dublin society attended. But of course, uh, getting the outfit together must have been a lot of work and also uh, rather expensive. But and th that was um, the marriage and the ceremonies that attended it and Mrs. McAniff's presentation into society. And then um, almost, a, almost a respectable period after the wedding, certainly a little over nine months, uh, she uh, gave birth to a son uh, at the Brook Enniskillen where she was now living with her husband. And that was her first son. Uh, and uh, subsequently, I think there was a daughter. Uh, sorry, that was there was a daughter first. And, and then in 1879, this is the announcement here, she had a son. And then I think another son followed a year, year and a half later. So that was the marriage. And Mr. McNiff also had a thriving uh, legal practice in Enniskillen. His father had been a solicitor in Sligo and he himself set up and practice in Enniskillen. He qualified in 1876, which was the year before he married. And an, an examination of Mr. McNiff's practice as reported in the local newspapers is quite interesting. Uh, he was a Catholic solicitor and I think he may have been the only Catholic solicitor in Enniskillen at the time. And he had some interesting cases. So uh, one of those cases was representing home rulers who had got into a fight with some orange men and broken the orange men's drums. So he probably got that because of his Catholic status. And he also uh, represented various parish priests, again, probably because he was the only Catholic solicitor in Enniskillen. And he did the usual type of local cases. So this is an example of a local case that actually went as far as the common pleas in uh, Dublin. And that was an action for slander. And um, the, the action for slander uh, 
uh, was uh, an action uh, that was brought, I think, um, by um, somebody in Enniskillen. It had been said to them, you're a robber, uh, you're going around the country robbing the people. And I think the, the plaintiff was a merchant. And uh, Mr. Mr. McAniff was acting for the defendant in this case, and I think he successfully got an order that the case be remitted to the chairman of the county of Fermanagh. So he successfully managed to keep this out of the High Court uh, in Dublin. Another case, uh, then, that's just an example of McNiff being appointed executor for a parish priest, so that just reflects his work for the priests. And uh, then there were a few other cases. I think this is a, a local case um, for a trespass. And um, you can see Mr. McNiff is representing uh, his client himself in the local magistrate's courts. And uh, he is well able to argue his case. His father had been famous solicitor in Sligo. He loved us uh, arguing cases and it was often said of him that he would have been happier being a barrister. And perhaps, as we'll see, uh, the barrister's life might have been more suited to Mr. McNiff as well, but we'll return to that in a few minutes. So one of the cases that Mr. McNiff fought and he successfully fought and that ended up in the Irish reports and in fact is still quoted in Eastman's cases today uh, is the case of Middleton and Clarence and is related to a tenant's right to take to throw spoil um, from a quarry on the lessor's adjoining land. And there was a recognition that the right to throw spoil on adjoining land could constitute an easement. So this is still cited uh, in the land law books today. And Mr. McNiff acted for the lessee in this case, and he was successful uh, in the claim. And I think the barrister who represented him in this case was a very well-known barrister called the McDermott. And he subsequently acted for Mr. McNiff later in, in, in less um, appealing circumstances, but we come to that anon. So one of the things that Mr. McNiff uh, did was he was very active in the cause of tenants' rights. And um, he spoke out a lot in relation to the inclusion by landlords in their leases, leases of clauses excluding the scope of the Land Act without the tenant properly realising the significance of this. So as we know, if a tenant renounces their statutory rights today, they have to get independent legal advice before that renunciation is valid. And this requirement of independent legal advice wasn't a necessary requirement under the Land Act for the tenant to revoke their rights. And Mr. McNiff was quite critical of this. And uh, his endeavours on the part of the tenants got him so well known that he was actually summoned to give evidence on the working of the Land Act to the Committee of the House of Lords in London. Um, well, maybe the committee, commission, commission, committee was meeting in Ireland, but he was summoned in any case. I think he may actually have gone to, to London for it. And uh, I mean, that shows how well known he was becoming in the area of tenants' rights uh, in the early 1880s. But there was also some uh, quite a bitchy letter published in the Freeman's Journal uh, complaining about uh, Mr. and If's assertions on behalf of the tenants and saying, that Mr. McNiff had asserted that he had more cases in relation to tenants than anyone else in, 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 in Fermanagh, and that this was not necessarily the case, and he was trying to court popularity for his business. So it seems that he was making some enemies as well. But he continued to agitate on behalf of the tenants, and I think one of his regular opponents uh, in relation to landlord-tenant cases was another solicitor in Enniskillen called Mr. Alexander, and um, he seems to have fallen out with Mr. McAniff. And again, this will come up again subsequently. So he did seem to have a thriving legal practice. Uh, and he was certainly well able to argue cases in court himself when he had to do so. So from looking at the reports of Mr. McNiff's legal business in the newspaper, one would expect that he was doing rather well. But unfortunately, uh, Mr. McNiff's thriving practice, or apparently thriving practice, um, because he was getting into debt as well, he, his practice got derailed in early 1885, I think, he became ill in March 1885. 
and he spent a number of months in bed. He was supposed to be suffering from fits. He said they were epileptic fits, but other people said that they were intemperance or drunkenness. And then there was the possibility that they might be due to intemperance of a different and even more scandalous kind. And that is really what was at the center of Mr. McNiff's divorce case later. But what happened anyway was that Mr. McNiff got sick in 1885. In 1885, later in 1885, Mrs. McNiff went up to the horse show in Dublin and she visited her sister, who was married to a well-known obstetrician, Dr. Gogarty of Rutland Square, now Parnell Square in Dublin. And she returned not in very good form. And then in early 1886, Mr. McNiff got sick again and he wanted to go up to Dublin to see the doctor. And uh, Mrs. McNiff refused to accompany him to Dublin and he had to go with somebody else. But then not long after he returned from Dublin in the summer of 1886, about a year and a half after Mr. McNiff got sick and a year after her visit to the horse show, Mrs. McNiff left and she went back to Galway where she had family. So this was a big, big shock. So there's the horse show, but I don't think poor Mrs. McNiff had much fun at the horse show that year. And that's the Gogarty residence in Parnell Square in Dublin. You'll still see a plaque there today. And uh, this is Air Square where Mrs. McNiff then went back to when she left her husband. And she also took the children with her, the three children, when she left her husband. And the next then we hear about Mr. McNiff is in late 1886, when he's in the Dublin police court. So what on earth could have happened? So Mr. McNiff's last case in 1886, his last ever reported case in Enniskillen, was in relation to a man who'd been creating a disturbance, and Mr. McNiff defended his client um, who was charged with creating this disturbance and said that he had previously been in a lunatic asylum, that's the client, and uh, that he was really unable to take a drink without getting into a state. So that was Mr. McNiff's defense. And ironically, within a matter of months, Mr. McNiff was himself in a lunatic asylum. And it happened like this, Mr. McNiff first went to Air Square in Dublin to visit his wife and children, but he didn't stay there long. And instead he came up to Dublin and he stayed at a hotel beside the Four Courts called the Angel Hotel, which was where the Four Courts Hotel subsequently was. It was the previous incarnation of the Four Courts Hotel and was just up here. So you see here the crowds and the keys for Parnell's funeral in 1881. And the Angel Hotel would have been in this block here at the time. I think it was 10 to 11 Inns Key. And that's where Mr. McNiff stayed with his mother. And the Angel Hotel was quite new at the time. It had a lovely billiard room. But, and you'll see the billiard room shown here. This is a plan of the billiard room published in the Irish Builder. But Mr. McNiff, I think, was ill because he still had this illness where he was getting fits and he stayed in his room most of the time. But he paid the bill by a check. And the check bounced. And subsequently, Mr. McNiff was arrested and he was taken to the Northern Divisional Police Court, which is right, was right behind the four courts where the Bridewell used to be and close to where the Bridewell police station is today. And he was charged with having obtained goods by false pr pretenses by means of dishonored checks. So I think there was a, 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 a draper or clothier that he had obtained clothes from. And then there was Mr. Healy, proprietor of the Angel Hotel, whom he'd given a blank check to, or given a check to when leaving. 
And Mr. McNave was terribly, terribly upset by this. It must have been a dreadful experience. That's the Dublin police court there in a different case. It must have been a terrible experience for him as a solicitor having to appear in the Dublin police court in relation to such a charge. And um, he attempted to commit suicide by cutting his neck with a pair of scissors. So he was desperately upset. And as a result of this attempt, he was placed in a lunatic asylum and uh, he was subsequently acquitted of the criminal charge on the ground of insanity. And he spent several months uh, in the asylum. And in 1887, Mr. McNiff came out of the asylum. The fit seemed to have eased for a while. So he was gonna make a new start. He opened offices, not in Enniskillen, but in a Thai County Kildare. And you can see his advert, advertising that he'd opened offices in Athai and he'd come to reside permanently in the town of Athai. But around the same time, he also applied to the um, Dublin police court himself on his own account, looking for protection against Dr. and Mrs. Gogarty. So he told the court the doctor and Mrs. Gogarty were persecuting him. And I'm sorry, I'm not sure this is actually the right report. I think I may have put in another report. I'm not sure what this is. Mm. Yeah, I seem to have lost the link to the Dublin Police Court, but in any event, in early 1887, Mr. McNiff appeared in the Dublin Police Court and he said that Dr. and Mrs. Gogarty were persecuting him and he asked for protection from them. And he was in a very distressed state at the time. He was in tears and he complained about being separated from his three beautiful children. So the newspapers didn't report at the time what exactly the persecution was that Mr. McNiff alleged that Dr. and Mrs. Gogarty, his brother and sister-in-law, had carried out. But it soon became a little bit clearer when Mr. McNiff issued slander proceedings against uh, Dr. and Mrs. Gogarty. And uh, this is just, it was February 1887. And this is the report in the Derby Telegraph where Mr. McNiff applied for protection. And uh, then uh, there were, was a subsequent case uh, in which a number of proceedings, uh, Mr. McNiff then subsequently from his premises in a thigh um, issued slander proceedings against a number of people including proceedings against Dr. and Mrs. Gogarty. And you can see here just this is, um, it, it, there was an application to have the slander proceedings against uh, Dr. Gogarty remitted to the county court on the basis that Mr. McNiff was insane and therefore, you know, the Gogartys shouldn't have the expense of having to defend the proceedings in the court of common plea, in the, in, or in the court of, the court of exchequer. Um, but uh, that was rejected. Um, Baron Dowes uh, said that, well, you know, uh, he had heard Mr. McNiff in court recently, he said, defending uh, a litigant in a thigh, and he'd been very impressed by him. And that was actually just the note there in March 1887 of Mr. McNiff defending somebody in a thigh. And when this application to remit came before him, Baron Dowes said that he as far as he was concerned, Mr. McNiff knew what he was doing. And uh, he said that the allegations, the allegations weren't reported, but Barnett House said these were very serious allegations and he was going to keep them in the, in the superior court. And um, because Baron Dowes was a bit of humorous, he also said that all men were a bit mad, really. So he threw that in, which was typical of Baron Dowes. But he does seem to have felt quite kindly uh, towards uh, Mr. McNiff. Uh, and he was obviously impressed with his court performance uh, when he had seen him in court previously. So uh, we're not told the slanders at this stage. But 
there was a, some correspondence in the newspaper, which again didn't disclose the slanders, but it was angry correspondence between Mr. McNiff and the Gogartys. And you can see just an example of this correspondence in this letter from Margaret Gogarty to the editor of The Freeman of June 1887. So Margaret Gogarty would have been the sister of Mrs. McNiff. She would be McNiff's sister-in-law and Dr. Gogarty's wife. And uh, she said that the public will soon have an opportunity of learning from the lips of my sister, Mrs. McNiff and her children, how and why they left their home in Enniskillen on the 2nd of April, 1886 to seek shelter in Galway. So, you know, that was a, a strong uh, declaration of war by Margaret Gogarty on behalf of her sister. And sadly, we don't have any photograph of Mr. or Mrs. McNiff, but we do have a photograph of Margaret Gogarty, her husband, and she had three children, they had three children as well, and you'll see them there. So that's Dr. Gogarty on the right, the imposing gentleman with the beard, and the lady on the left is Margaret. And uh, Eulick O'Connor, uh, Margaret's son, this little boy here, Oliver, became quite famous subsequently. I'm sure you may have heard of him. And uh, Eulick O'Connor, in his great biography of Oliver, uh, gave a little write-up of Margaret. He said she was a woman of strong character. Her complexion was perfect. She had the gift of the gab and inexhaustible energy. And I think there was a book dedicated to her. She was very religious. And there was a book dedicated to her called Letters of an Irish Catholic Layman. And at the beginning of the book, it said to Mrs. Margaret Gogarty, a lady who to all the graces and attractions of her sex adds virile force of intellect and judgment. So she sounds quite formidable as her letter to the Freeman would indicate. So that brings us on to the question at the heart of the McNiff divorce. What on earth had the Gogarty said to lead McNiff to accuse them of persecuting him and to sue them for slander? And this brings me on to something which was at the very heart of every good 19th century scandal between husband and wife, which was the question of venereal disease. So you see here a piece of 19th century art. You see a gentleman here. You see the, the, the habits of intemperance with the drink. Uh, you can see a lady here behind, alluring, but also quite evil looking in the face. And then you have this kind of monstrous creature between the lady and the man. So I think that's intended to represent a man who has been infected with syphilis and his regret and the ghost of the contagion hovering over him. And of course, a lot of men who caught venereal disease also infected their wives. And the allegation that McNiff had done this was really at the heart of the case and might explain the Gogarty's enmity against him. So um, another divorce case around this time, which also involved allegations of um, a wife being infected with venereal disease and which had an Irish element to it, was the Campbell divorce case in, um, in, in London involving members of the aristocracy. Lady Colin Campbell is this lady here. She was actually Irish by birth. She was an Irish lady called Gertrude Blood and an Anglo-Irish lady, and she married uh, Sir Colin Campbell who was very well connected in the aristocracy, but unfortunately suffered from syphilis and she sought a divorce or perhaps he divorced her, I can't remember, um, but she alleged that he had infected her with syphilis and just this is a photo again of a Gertrude Blood and she does indeed look very like her portrait. So uh, this was, I suppose, the Irish equivalent of the Colin Campbell case because it involved similar uh, allegations. But we have to remember that the person who was alleging, it was very difficult to definitively prove the venereal disease one way or the other, and it was difficult really to say also to distinguish between one type of venereal disease and another in the 19th century. And we have to remember that the doctor who diagnosed Mrs. McAniff and who gave evidence at her trial was her brother-in-law, so he wasn't entirely objective. And could the, the argument that McNiff put forward was that the Gogarty's had made up 
this entire allegation of venereal disease. Uh, they had completely made it up simply to blacken him, to break up his marriage because they didn't want him to get his hands on his wife's quarter of the Oliver fortune. Because not long before all this blew up, Mrs. O Mr. Oliver, uh, Mrs. McNiff's father had died and he had divided his fortune between his um, daughters, of whom Mrs. Gogarty was one. And it also has to be said that Dr. Gogarty did have a track record of fighting with brothers-in-law. So you had a case in 1882 uh, involving Patrick Mohan, who was the, the um, husband of Dr. Gogarty's late sister. And he claimed that Dr. Gogarty had ruined him by first appropriating possessions belonging to him, which he'd left in Dr. Gogarty's house, and then counterclaiming for debt when Mohan sued for these possessions back. And Mohan's last words as he left the court was, were to Dr. Gogarty, you have ruined me. So, you know, to fall out with one brother-in-law might be, you know, unfortunate, but to fall out with two, both of whom claimed they'd been unjustly treated, one, the husband of your sister, and the other, the husband of your sister-in-law, do does seem strange. So perhaps Dr. Gogarty was quite a domineering personality, but would he go so far as to make up an allegation that his sister-in-law was infected with venereal disease? I mean, that would have been prejudicial to her as well and to her children. So it's hard to know. But all this was aired in any event at the divorce trial in 1888. So uh, the application for divorce, it, they called it a divorce, and the correct title was a divorce at men said thorough, but it was what we would now regard as a judicial separation. In Ireland at the time, you couldn't get a divorce without passing a private member's bill uh, through um, the, the, um, uh, it, the English Parliament. So you had to go to the Irish courts, the ecclesiastical division of the Irish courts, and you had to get your divorce at Mense Toro, the separation first. And then if you wanted to say remarry, you could apply to have a, a private member's bill passed and get your formal uh, divorce and be able to remarry. So it, some people never went on to the divorce proper stage and they just stayed at the separation stage. And there were so you can see three grounds for divorce and men said thorough, adultery, cruelty, and unnatural practices. And the grounds on which Mrs. McNiff relied were the first two. She didn't accuse her husband of unnatural practices, but she did accuse him of adultery and cruelty. And this is just, a, on the previous slide, they were extracts from the Law Reform Commission report on divorce at Mensa, Mensa Thoreau. And uh, you can see there, it says that physical cruelty was not limited to cases of force. And it is likely uh, that the Irish courts would take the same view as English courts in holding that communication by of venereal disease uh, was grounds for divorce. So that was that was the view of the Law Reform Commission, and that seems to have been the case as well at the time of the McNiff divorce. So effectively, the cruelty element was uh, that he had infected her with a venereal disease. And just as I mentioned, um, there was a Matrimonial Causes Act in Britain, which was passed in 1857, which uh, removed the need to bring private members' bills to get a divorce proper in England, but that didn't apply in Ireland. So as late as 1907, you see this discussion um, in, in, in the House of Lords uh, relating to uh, the fact that it is still not possible for Irish people to get a divorce without this private member's bill going through. But this was only the separation stage, really, although they called it a divorce uh, in the newspapers. But now it's regarded as a judicial separation. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, the first thing then that um, uh, that happened was uh, that there was this application um, in early 1888 by Mr. Todd, uh, who subsequently became the recorder of Derry and was a very colourful character. He was always fighting with solicitors in court. And he moved on behalf of Mrs. McNiff to fix the time and mode of trial for this divorce trial. And um, he uh, gave the details of the marriage and the children. And uh, the judge said the trial had to take place before a jury. And then Mr. Philip Kyo, who was Mr. McNiff's counsel, and he was a very well-known practitioner um, in, 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 in Dublin, um, asked that the trial should take place before a special jury of the County of Dublin. And the reason that Mr. Kyo gave for this was that, um, that Dr. Gogoshi was so well known in the city of Dublin, he had such an enormous practice as an obstetrician, that it would not be possible for Mr. McNiff to get a fair trial before a Dublin jury. And I think a county jury, uh, Judge Wardenworth doesn't sound too keen on it here, but I think a special jury was in fact subsequently uh, sworn in. Uh, so that was the first notice in the newspaper really about this divorce. There was an implied threat in Margaret Gogarty's earlier letter, but this was the first, you know, formal communication that there were divorce proceedings uh, coming up. And then the divorce proper started a month or two later. Things moved much more quickly in the courts in those days. So, you know, um, you could get cases heard really within six months. And um, in, again, later in the spring of 1888, um, this divorce um, a, a case came up. And you can see there just some of the evidence uh, that took place. So uh, this, oh, sorry. Uh, this report is just a report of evidence um, by uh, Julia McAniff. Um, and uh, she talked, first of all, about how she was quite happy with Mr. McNiff at the beginning, but then he made advances to a nursery governess called Greta Connors, and she had to let her go. And Mr. McNiff wasn't very happy about her going. He was upset about the girl losing his position because of his advances. But, uh, you know, uh, Mrs. McNiff had no choice. But then things went from bad to worse because she got another governess called Miss Lynch. And in the meantime, Mr. McNiff was drinking heavily and owing to his habits, uh, Mrs. McNiff felt compelled to occupy a different bed in the same room with her youngest child. So they were still in the same bedroom, but they were in different beds. And uh, then in February, then her husband got sick in 1885. And in February 1886, he wanted to go and see the doctor in Dublin. So this would be after Miss McNiff's horse show visit in which Dr. Gogarty um, had apparently diagnosed her as suffering with venereal disease. And uh, he wanted then to go to Dublin to have his illness treated and Mrs. McNiff wouldn't accompany him. So the new governess, who was a lady called Anne Lynch, said that she would accompany him. And they were supposed to come back that night, but they didn't come back for a fortnight. And they stayed in a lodging house in Laura Gardner Street and they went to the theatre occasionally. And they shared a room with a locked door and they also, and the judge drew particular attention to this in his summing up, they also ordered in whiskey and oysters. So in any event, when they returned, as one can imagine, Mrs. McNiff wasn't in very good form. And um, she uh, eventually, the straw that broke the camel's back was one night when she was in bed, in her bed, in the room that she shared with Mr. McNiff. And she heard Miss Lynch come in, she heard whispering to her husband, certain noises from the other bed, and she asked what was happening, and her husband said, now we're just saying our prayers. Uh, so, you know, uh, that was something as well that he used to say at the lodging house in Dublin when he went into the bedroom with Miss Lynch, now let us have our prayers. So um, at that point, Miss McNiff pawned her jewellery and she went back to go all the way with the children. So that was her story anyway. Um, so what, so, um, also, uh, the lodging house keeper of this lodging house in Gardner Street gave evidence and about the oysters and the locked bedroom door and the prayers too. So it was looking pretty bad 
for Mr. McNiff. And certainly the judge in his summing up, uh, you know, expressed the view that he certainly thought that something had happened, that no governess would behave this way or should behave this way unless there was something untoward going on with the master of the house. Um, so uh, Ms. Dr. Gogarty also gave evidence, presumably about Mr. McNiff and the venereal disease, but the jury doesn't seem to have believed Dr. Gogarty's evidence because they found, a, they found for Mrs. McNiff on the adultery only, but they didn't find against Mr. McNiff on cruelty. So that indicates that he was kind of vindicated on that point. Possibly simply because, you know, there wasn't clear, possible to be clear medical evidence in that point. But certain, um, uh, certain subsequent details do indicate that perhaps, uh, you know, Dr. Gogarty may have been wrong about maybe either the venereal disease or the seriousness. Um, basically, the, the parties lived too long, really, for it to have been anything like syphilis, because they did live to quite a long age, both of them, unlike poor Lady Colin Campbell. So um, perhaps, uh, you know, Dr. Gogarty was, was not right in his diagnosis. But in any event, there was a finding against Mr. McNiff uh, on the grounds of um, adultery. Uh, meanwhile, he was still writing to the newspapers, uh, saying that he was willing to accept an apology if his wife came back to him and so forth. So the newspaper letters to the Freeman were still going on, probably sold quite a lot of papers. And he appealed the verdict of the jury, but he was unsuccessful um, in the, the appeal. So he didn't succeed in the appeal. And around the same time, there was other very bad news for Mr. McNiff. <coughs> because he had a lot of things going on while his divorce trial was going on <laughs> and in the year previous. <coughs> Sorry. His practice in Athai collapsed after a few months. A couple of reasons. He was doing quite well in the litigation element down in Athai, but he fell out with his law clerk. And in addition to that, he got into trouble for traveling on the train from Dublin to Athai. Um, uh, he was traveling in a first class carriage, even though he only had a third class ticket. Apparently the law clerk had bought him the wrong category of ticket and he was prosecuted for that. It wasn't a huge fine, but it was embarrassing. And then he discovered that the Incorporated Law Society were bringing proceedings to have him struck off the roll because of the previous embezzlement and certain other allegations that had been made about him by clients in Enniskillen about him, you know, having received money on their behalf and not paid it over. So um, at the same time as he was dealing with the divorce proceedings, um, before um, Mr. I can't remember his name, before the before, um, Mr. Justice Warren, he was also dealing with proceedings before the Lord Chancellor, Lord Ashburn, um, in relation to the Law Society's application to have him struck off the rolls. And he tried in these proceedings to bring up the issue with the Gogarty's, and, and he did actually read out in court a long affidavit about his persecution um, um, a, by the Gogarty's, although the Lord Chancellor allowed him to read it out as he was representing himself, although uh, he didn't um, think it was relevant. Um, Mr. McNiff, at this stage, really, he um, um, didn't really seem to have anyone uh, representing him. Mr. Keogh had represented him in the divorce, but I don't think he represented him on appeal. Uh, the McDermott, who previously acted for him, uh, was instructed by him in Middleton and Clarence in a successful early case, had represented him initially at the slander proceedings, but the slander proceedings seemed to be dying away now. They, he didn't seem to be able to continue with them. Uh, so he was all on his own um, before the Lord Chancellor. And he produced a letter um, from uh, somebody who had made the complaint, one of the complaints against him, a man called James Shannon. And that letter said, I beg to inform you that I was induced by Mr. Alexander and Eskillen to send a petition against you to the Lord Chancellor. So you might remember Mr. Alexander. He was the solicitor who acted for the landlords in, the, in a few cases against Mr. McNiff in Enniskillen when Mr. McNiff was representing tenants. So it seems there must have been some enmity um, uh, between them. But the Lord Chancellor felt that there were other allegations <coughs> and that, in fact, the Law Society 
had not um, uh, issued the petition on foot of any representations by Mr. Alexander, although perhaps he made representations behind the scenes, who knows? But Mr. Magniff was struck off, <coughs> not without some reluctance, by the Lord Chancellor who said that there was nothing more painful than having to strike someone off the rolls. And he said that Mr. Magniff had shown considerable ability in court. But I think it's probably fair to say that Mr. Magniff wasn't really great at practice management and particularly money management. There were just a little too many cases um, you know, to believe that it was all made up. He also owed a lot of debts. I mean, by his own admission, he lived on credit. And Although there was no doubt he had been treated quite harshly in relation to some of them, for example, his other sister-in-law, Miss Oliver from Galway, applied to have him made bankrupt on foot of a debt that he owed her father. Um, but, you know, he, he certainly owed a lot of money and didn't seem to be very careful with his client's money. So, you know, he, that's what I mean by saying he might have been better off perhaps as a barrister rather than a solicitor where he could have, you know, um, he could have profited from his excellent advocacy skills um, while not having the difficulty of um, managing a client account. So what happened afterwards? <coughs> So, I mean, we, we see Mr. McNeil at a really low point now in 1888. Okay, he has been cleared by a jury in relation to the allegation of having infected his wife with venereal disease. He has recovered his health to some extent, but he has been struck off the rolls of solicitors and he is now a bankrupt and he has effectively lost his wife and uh, children. And he said before the Lord Chancellor, <coughs> that if he was struck off, he'd have no option but to go to America. And it seems that's what Mr. McNiff did. We find here a life insurance policy in relation to Mr. McNiff being sold um, uh, by the uh, vice chancellor. Um, and uh, Mr. McNiff subsequently went off to America. He went off to New York, Manhattan, where he bought into, I think, a, 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 a lawyer's practice in Manhattan. And that's the last, that advertisement for his insurance policy, the sale of his insurance policy is the last we hear of Mr. McNiff in Ireland. But we hear two years later about the death of Dr. Gogarty. So, you know, Dr. Gogarty was doing really well. He had this big practice, beautiful wife, hugely well respected. So his star was shining compared to that of McNiff's um, in 1888, but yet, only three years later, Dr. Gogarty dropped dead at the age of only uh, 55. And um, some people say it was appendicitis. Ulick O'Connor in his biography of Oliver St. John Gogarty, St. John Gogarty says it was appendicitis. Um, but the newspaper reporters at the time said it was a heart attack. I mean, who knows? But a sad end really uh, for Dr. Gogarty. Though some might say, you know, that's what happens when you're not very nice to your brothers-in-law and you say things about them to people. But there you go. So that's the funeral. And you can see that one of the mourners at the funeral was Master Oliver St. John Gogarty, uh, who was Dr. Gogarty's eldest son. And we'd be returning to him in a moment. As regards uh, Miss Lynch, one always wonders what happened to Miss Lynch, that unusual governess who had an unusual and very ungovernance like relationship with her employer. Uh, whether it was as a friend or a lover, who knows, but it certainly breached the bounds of Victorian conventions. So naturally, we would be interested to know what happened to Miss Lynch. So I found a few references to Anne Lynch in the criminal courts. I don't know if it's her or not. In 1891, a servant girl named Anne Lynch was charged with having stolen a large quantity of clothing from somebody in Prince Edward Terrace, Black Rock. She'd been there for a month and she was a very good servant. So was that her? I don't know. But what might be more likely to be her was a lady called Anne Lynch in Harles Cross, and she was charged with baby farming in 1893. Baby farming involved looking after a large number of children and not caring for them very well so that they died. Sometimes this was deliberate on the part of the baby farmer. There was a dreadful case called, called uh, Macon in Australia involving baby farmers who deliberately murdered children in their care and kept receiving the money for their care. 
Um, there were other cases where the baby farmers just were, were, were taking on too many children or weren't able to look after them properly. And Anne Lynch was charged with the murder of two children who were entrusted to her care. They died of emaciation. It was a tragic case. Their father then reported her and they were prosecuted. Not sure why they were left in her care. If they had a father, perhaps he was he, his, his wife had died. But it was a terribly sad case. And she was originally charged with manslaughter. But the charge was reduced then to, to, to not caring for the children properly. So it was a lower charge. But I wonder, was this possibly Anne Lynch, who had been a governess in the McNiff household, but who surely would never have been employed by any other family as governess after the evidence that was given about her at the McNiff trial? So then what happened to the McNiff children? Well, it seems that they went to the States. Um, the two older children actually went to the States. They were in the States, certainly from, um, from uh, um, the, the turn of the 20th century onwards. They married there uh, and uh, they were the families there. So there are no McNiff descendants in Ireland. There was a third son who was Oliver, and he was called Oliver, the same reason that Oliver St. John Gogarty was called Oliver, Oliver after their mother's original maiden name, uh, the Olivers of Galway. And poor Oliver McNiff died in Brooklyn in 1897 at the age of 16. So the children went to America where their father was practicing as a, a, a lawyer. You can see there Oliver is described as the youngest son of John McNiff, counselor at law. And Mr. Magniff seems to have continued to practice as a lawyer in New York without too much difficulty because he remains on the, the register of lawyers in New York. And he died, I think, in 1919. So he lived to a good age, which indicates probably that he didn't have uh, uh, syphilis or he probably would have died earlier. And likewise, Mrs. Magniff lived to 1920 and she died in Ireland. I don't know whether she returned to him and that's why the children were in New York or if they left and went to live with um, with uh, with their father. I, 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 I don't know. But um, if we turn then to Oliver McNiff's cousin, the son of the Gogarty family, also Oliver, you can see him there. This is the picture with his parents when he was younger. And here he is as an adult in a painting by William Orpen. Uh, a son of the Dublin solicitor himself. And uh, you can see there the older Gogarty. And this painting is very famous because Gogarty was a friend of James Joyce and is immortalized as Buck Mulligan um, in the first sentence of Ulysses. So um, one wonders whether if his strict father, Dr. Gogarty had lived, young Oliver would have got to do quite so much carousing and would have featured in the same way in Ulysses. I doubt it very much. He probably wouldn't even have been allowed to associate uh, with James Joyce and certainly not to go on nighttime wanderings with him. Uh, so one might argue that in a way, Mr. McNiff is responsible for Ulysses because maybe without him, and the stress of all this litigation, Dr. Gogarty would have lived longer. Oliver's life would have been indifferent. And the material for Ulysses perhaps would not have been accumulated and maybe the book would never have been published, who knows. But uh, that's the story anyway of the McNiff divorce. And you can see a lot of features that were characteristic of divorces of the time. And uh, members of the professional classes tended to feature a lot uh, in divorce cases in Ireland and they tended to be quite lurid divorces. So hopefully I'll get to share some more uh, subsequently. So thanks so much for listening.